Tom Spear, a member of the International Hydrofoil Society, and this is my presentation for the Society's 50th anniversary. I was a member of the Oracle Team USA design team for the 34th match for the America's Cup that was held in San Francisco Bay in 2013. My presentation is going to talk about yacht design for the America's Cup, including a brief history of the America's Cup itself, some aspects of sailing performance, the aerodynamic and hydrodynamic design of high performance craft like the AC-72, then go into the AC-72 design itself and the events of the regatta. So with that, let's go on to the history of the America's Cup. Talk about yacht design for the 34th America's Cup. The America's Cup, shown on the left, is the oldest trophy in international sport. In 1851, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, held great exposition in her honor. This was the first World's Fair. As part of this, the Royal Yacht Squadron held a race around the Island of Wight open to yachts of all nations. Now this was a time when Britannia ruled the waves and the British believed they had the highest maritime technology in the world. So members of the New York Yacht Club formed a syndicate to commission the design and building of a yacht to enter this race. And the idea was that they would sail to England and they would engage in racing with British yachts for high value bets and they would clean up and make money on the deal. So they built the boat, they sailed it to England and when she arrived there was another yacht waiting to escort her in. George Schuyler, one of the members of the syndicate, said that they had their cruising sails on and enough provisions for a voyage to India, but they couldn't help themselves. There was dead silence on the boat as they all hunkered down and passed the other yacht. Well, word got around that this was a fast boat and the bets dried up. So that part of the plan was not going very well. But they were able to enter into the race around the Island of Wight. Now at that time, the tradition in England was for yachts to start a race from anchor, which was not what the U.S. sailors were used to. So they had difficulty getting their anchor up and raising sails at the same time and ended up being the last ones to start. The yachts all disappeared around the island and some hours later, a lone sail appeared coming around the opposite limb. This Queen, Vic Queen Victoria then asked well, who is leading and the answer was it is the America and then she asked the famous question well who is in second and the answer is your majesty there is no second the America was about 20 minutes ahead of the nearest yacht at that time now the wind was dying as she headed up the estuary to cows in the finish and there were three other yachts that were catching her but she ended up winning the race by about 10 minutes. Now the members of the syndicate sold the yacht to a European yachtsman and sold her for enough money to cover the cost of building and sailing to England. So that part actually worked out. They came back on a steamer with the cup. Now some years later George Schuyler, the last surviving member of the syndicate, put up the cup as a perpetual trophy for friendly competition between nations. And that's how the America's Cup competition got started. In the picture on the right, you can see 130 years of America's Cup technology in one shot. The boat with three sails is an exact reproduction of the schooner America. The boat on the left is the wing-sailed trimaran that won the America's Cup and brought it back to the United States in 2010. So let's talk about some aspects of sailing performance and what it takes to win a race like the America's Cup. The fundamentals of sailing yacht performance are related to the wind triangle. This is the vector combination of the true wind that is blowing, the boat's velocity through the water, and the apparent wind, which is what you actually feel. Now, in this diagram, the boat's 
direction of travel with respect to the true wind is shown by the angle gamma. And the angle between the apparent wind and the boat's velocity is shown by the angle beta. Now when the yacht is traveling into the wind, the wind of course is coming from somewhat to the side but mostly ahead. And the boat's velocity and the true wind speed add together to make the apparent wind greater than either the boat's velocity or the true wind. Going downwind, when, when the boat is sailing at greater than 90 degrees to the true wind, as shown by the angle gamma, then the boat's velocity subtracts from the true wind and the apparent wind is less. However, if the boat's velocity is great enough, the apparent wind is still coming from ahead rather than from behind, like the true wind. And this is the situation that you have with high performance boats like sailing hydrofoils. And again, the angle beta is the angle between the apparent wind and the boat's velocity. Now, the, you can take the, the aerodynamic force that's applied to the boat by the sail rig and divide it into two components. One is the aerodynamic drag, which is parallel to the apparent wind, and the other is the aerodynamic lift, which is perpendicular to the apparent wind. Now, when the aerodynamic force is applied to the boat, the boat is driven forward and it drifts somewhat to the side, and the angle that it goes to the side is called the leeway angle. And it's necessary because the, the boat has to generate a hydrodynamic lift that opposes the side force from the aerodynamic lift. And, of course, the boat also has a hydrodynamic drag component, which is parallel to the boat's velocity. So the leeway angle will change in, until the hydrodynamic forces exactly balance the aerodynamic forces. And I've shown two other angles on this diagram, the hydrodynamic drag angle, epsilon hydro, and the aerodynamic drag angle, epsilon arrow. And I'll have the equations for these in the next figure, but it helps to picture them because basically the larger the drag angle, excuse me, the larger the amount of drag, the, the larger the drag angle is for both the hydrodynamic and aerodynamic forces. So these are the equations for those drag angles. The aerodynamic drag angle is the arc tangent of the aerodynamic drag divided by the aerodynamic lift. And likewise, the hydrodynamic drag angle is the arc tangent of the hydrodynamic drag divided by the hydrodynamic lift. Now, it turns out that these two drag angles exactly add up to the apparent wind angle. So if you want to make the, the drag as low as possible, which means making the sum of these two drag angles as low as possible, that means that the apparent wind angle is small, which, uh, which means that the wind is coming from more ahead than it is from behind. And that works into this fundamental sailing performance equation highlighted in yellow, where the boat's velocity is equal to the velocity of the true wind times the sign of the difference between the boat's angle to the true wind and the apparent wind divided by the sine of the apparent wind angle. Now when you substitute in the drag angles for the apparent wind angle, what you see is that in the denominator you have the sine of the sum of the two drag angles. And in order to maximize the boat speed, what you want to do is to minimize those two angles. So the key to sailing performance is to minimize the drag to lift ratio, or in other words, to increase the, the lift to drag ratio. So the key to that is to reduce the drag. That's much more powerful than increasing the lift. And everything about both the aerodynamic and hydrodynamic design of these yachts is all about how to minimize that drag while also satisfying all the other constraints uh, to keep the boat upright and uh, and moving. 
Now you can plot the performance of the boat on a polar diagram. Now this is rather complicated, but it has a wealth of information on it. So what it shows is if you were to plot the direction of travel and, and, the, and the speed of the boat um, in, in each angle to the true wind, you get the line shown in red. Uh, this this is the polar for that trimaran that was in the picture with the uh, uh, yacht America. Now, if you plot lines of constant apparent wind angle, you get the circles shown in blue. And if you plot lines of constant ratio of apparent wind speed to boat speed, you get the circles shown in green. And it turns out that the blue circles and green circles meet at right angles everywhere. So this is almost like a, a different coordinate system, but it's in terms of apparent wind angle and apparent wind speed ratio. And so you can actually plot the performance by measuring those two things on board the boat and then relating it back to where the true wind is. And this is what's done in the instruments that are used to uh, estimate the true wind while the boat is sailing. So let's talk about the wing sails that drive the boat. A wing sail, is shown in the left, is basically a rigid wing used as a sail. Now, saw sails, like on the Schooner America, act like airplane wings, so it makes sense that you can use an airplane wing as a sail. So in the beginning, sailing yachts had fixed masts and fabric mainsails. And then they developed uh, rotating masts with fully battened sails. This came in uh, basically in the 1960s. And now there are full wings with no mainsails at all, and everything is just a rigid sail like the uh, like an airplane wing. Now, why would you want to use such a thing for sails? Uh, well, one reason is that you get a higher maximum lift for the same amount of sail area, and this gives you power going downwind. The other reason is it has lower profile drag, which means you can uh, point higher and go faster. The control system of a rigid wing allows for the precise control of the twist. In a soft sail, you have to use an extreme amount of tension along the back edge of the sail, the leech, in order to control twist. But you can have a control system inside a wing sail that will allow you to do that much easier with lower forces. And control of twist is very important because it controls how the lift is distributed along the span of the wing. And this determines how much drag is associated with that lift, what we call induced drag. And induced drag is the largest aerodynamic drag component. And it is uh, very much under the control uh, through, the, through the twist. And uh, the control system of the wing also allows the precise control of the camber, which is the curvature of the wing. Uh, and that uh, is important for transitioning between uh, high lift and low drag. So for uh, going downwind in light winds, you need high lift. But going upwind, uh, you need to depower and sail with low drag. Now, is also an advantage for structural loads. I mentioned the very high tension that's needed along the leech control twist of a soft sail. And you can do the same twist control with much smaller internal loads in the wing. So you don't have to react those large loads to the entire rest of the platform. And this makes for a big savings in weight. So even though the wing sail itself is heavier than a soft sail, the net weight in the entire boat can be lighter. And finally, the control of the wing sail allows for instant control of the power of the wing. Because of the low loads, it's very quick to rotate the wing and, and regulate how much power it's producing. Whereas with a soft sail, 
you have to basically wind in uh, that tension on the, the sheet in the traveler and it, and it takes longer. So America's Cup first used wing sails in 1988 with uh, on the catamaran Stars and Stripes against the New Zealand boat KZ-1 which used a fixed mast and a uh, saw sail with uh, fully battened sails. Wing sails were used again in 2010 on the Trimaran uh, 17 in its uh, race against uh, an, a giant catamaran, a Lingi 5. And in both cases, the yachts with wing sails uh, had much better performance than the yachts with the soft sails. So what makes up a wing sail? Well, the first part is the main element, and this is the the main structural part of the wing. The next is the the, the uh, flap segments. Now the the flap is divided into several segments along the span so that uh, because of the uh, changing angle of the hinge line and so that they can be independently controlled. Between the main element and the and the flap is a slot and so the the flap and the main element basically work together as uh, interacting uh, wings to uh, create uh, a uh, performance that's greater than either one could do separately. Now controlling the angle of the flaps are the control arms and these are uh, run by cables that go up and down the main element. Those cables end at the main control arm at the bottom. And so the, uh, basically the, the control arm at the bottom regulates the, the angle of the flap all up and down the span through those cables. And finally, the entire wing is rotated with the traveler control line. So the crew uh, actively trims the sail by rotating the entire wing and then the, uh, the camber and the twist controls are secondary controls to optimize the performance. Now let's take a look at slicing the wing uh, to look at a cross section. So the main element is teardrop shaped and some wings, but not all, have a rotating flap on the main element called the tab. And then you have the flap, which is another teardrop shape behind the main element. And the flap is hinged ahead of the trailing edge of the main element so that when it rotates, it forms the slot. And the, the flap angle, it uh, takes the place of the camber of uh, a soft sail. So on a soft sail, camber is the amount of curvature to the sail. And for a rigid wing, the flap angle serves the same role. Now, twist is the angle of the... Uh, entire section uh, up the wing compared to the, the section at the bottom. So uh, while it, the rigid wing is, is fairly rigid, it does in fact uh, distort under load and that's, the, that's what causes the twist. Now you can have twist in the main element and you can also have twist in the flaps. Uh, for the AC-72 that we designed for the America's Cup uh, the uh, main element did not twist very much at all, and, and we did not try to control that twist, but we did control the twist of the flap, and the flaps could twist as much as 40 degrees between the bottom and the top. So let's look at how that system works by taking a look at the control system on the AC-45, which is the smaller, simpler boat. So if you consider the forces acting on the wing, you have the aerodynamic lift, which is pushing the wing to the side. Now that lift is opposed by a side force at the ball that the, that the wing sits on, the stays that hold it upright, and the traveler control line that goes to the bottom corner. Now, because the 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 traveler, the ball, and the stays are all at the edges, and the lift is, is occurring in the middle, the entire wing wants to kind of fold up like a taco. And 
that amount of that 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 degree of folding is controlled by the camber control line at the bottom which restricts how much movement that that main control arm can make. So if the crew wants the wing to be flatter, they shorten that line. If they want the flaps to be angled more, then they loosen that line. And the beauty of doing it this way is it's the same on both tacks. A sailboat has to sail uh, equally well in each direction to the wind, with the wind coming over the right side, which is starboard tack, or the wind coming over the left side, which is port tack. And this arrangement allows the crew to just set the camber, and it's the same on both tacks. They don't have to change it every time that they tack or jibe. So the main control arm at the bottom is connected with these control, ar control lines to the arms at each one of the flap segments going up the, the wing. And the, the key thing here is those control lines, cross over each other between the main control arm and the other control arms so that the uh, the the force on the uh, the main control arm then uh, is acting on the opposite control arms of all the others and this is what synchronizes all the other uh, flap segments with the main control arm at the bottom so here's what that looks like uh, in practice on the AC-72. You can see the main control arm at the bottom. The large sort of bolt in the middle uh, is where the flap pivots. And then that sector um, that's on the main control arm is the twist control. And so all of the cables from the other control arms running up the wing uh, dead end on that sector. And by allowing it to rotate, then it allows the control arms to be eased off at the top of the wing, which uh, allows the, the flap to be twisted. So let's now talk about the aerodynamics of the wing sail. The key to understanding the three-dimensional aerodynamics is to look at the wake. So when the boat is sailing, the apparent wind is coming from ahead and to the side, and the aerodynamic lift is at right angles to the apparent wind. Now the boat bends that wind to windward, which is, and it's that reaction of changing the wind's momentum that generates the lift. Because the wing has only a finite span to it, a finite length, the, the wind kind of, uh, curls around the edges of this part of the wind that is deflected by the wing sail. And this results in two vortices at the top and the bottom. And because the, the, uh, the wing is deflecting the, the wind, the apparent wind that's actually felt at each section of the wing is, uh, is not exactly the same as the, the apparent wind that you would measure just from the boat's speed and the true wind. Now on the right, you can see a photo taken of a Volvo 70 yacht leaving Cape Town in a fog. And you can see that wake that's being shed behind the boat in, in the fog. Now because that, of the deflection of the wind from the, the sail, the boat actually sails in a wind shift that is of its own making. And so that rotates the aerodynamic lift more to the side and reduces the amount of drive. And the amount of that drive reduction uh, appears to be like a drag. So that's called induced drag. And it is the largest source of aerodynamic drag on the boat. So when you're designing the, the sail, you can basically take this complicated three-dimensional aerodynamic problem and break it into two two-dimensional problems. The first, you can think of the flow of the wake passing through a plane that is perpendicular to the apparent wind. And you use this to design the planform shape of the wing. The other plane is parallel to the wind and parallel to the water. And 
this is to, used to design the cross-section shape of the wing. So you can treat the cross-sections as though the wing had an infinite length to it, and then the finite length aspect is handled by looking at the wake. So here's what that wing section looks like. Uh, on the upper left, you have uh, a plot of the wing section shape and the pressures on the wing. You can see that there's a peak near the leading edge of the main element and another big peak near the leading edge of the flap. And uh, on the right is a, uh, is a close-up of the grid, which in this case, uh, the grid used to calculate the aerodynamics is aligned with the streamlines. So the, the grid lines actually show the direction of the flow around the, the, uh, the section. So how does a wing mass compare to a wing sail? Um, so the, the wing mass and, and sail combination in principle can produce the same spanwise lift distribution as a wing sail. So the main difference has to do with the cross-section shape. So here are two different sections designed for similar purposes. Uh, in black is a wing sail, at, excuse me, a rotating mast and sail combination, and in red is a rigid wing sail. Now the plot on the right shows the, uh, the lift versus angle of attack, and the plot on the left shows the lift versus the, the drag. So what you want is to basically be uh, up and to the right corner of the lift and drag uh, plots. In red is the data for the wing sail, and in black is the, the rotating wing mast and sail combination. The wing mast and sail can match the wing sail at one operating point, but the wing sail has a much wider range of operation than the, uh, the wing mast and sail. So this is one of the advantages that makes it uh, a much more versatile sail rig than the, uh, the conventional sail. So the, the wing mast, excuse me, the wing sail compared to a conventional sail has a higher maximum lift. It can have a smaller ma uh, minimum drag and, and as I mentioned, it has a much better overall uh, performance. So this, that, that tolerance to changing conditions makes it easier to sail, and it also makes it more forgiving to turbulence in the air. So here's what the wind looks like. Uh, these are service streamlines uh, around the wing sail and jib of an AC-72 looking at the, at the windward side and the leeward side. And on the, the graph on the right shows how the lift is distributed between the, the foot and the head. And this is to minimize that induced drag while also uh, minimizing the, uh, the healing moments that want to tip over the boat. So the wing aerodynamic design, when you're looking at maximum lift, you also need to consider the healing moment on the boat because that has that can be no greater than the riding moment available from the hull. And you need to consider the aerodynamic stall, which is the maximum lift that you can produce uh, before the, the uh, airflow no longer flows smoothly around the sail. And the healing moment basically dictates the, the area of the sail and the, the height of the rig whereas the stall characteristics are determined by the section and, uh, and thus the, the slotted flap. Now to minimize the drag, you, you try to make the, the rig as tall as possible and also shape the plan form and control the twist. And the, uh, the other drag component from the wing is the profile drag, which is due to the wing area and the section shape. And so the, many of these aspects are, are determined by the AC-72 design rule that uh, uh, restricted the shape of the plan form and the shape of the section.
Next, I'd like to talk about the hydrodynamic design, especially the hydrofoils. Hydrofoils are wings that operate in water instead of air. In all respects, they operate just like an airplane wing to support the boat. In these photos, you can see the hydrofoils on an AC-72, which consists of a wing extending off the bottom of the dagger boards, and then another one which is at the base of the rudder and acts like the tail of an airplane. Now there are several types of hydrofoils that you can categorize according to their shape. In this figure, the D shape is the cross section of the hull, and the red dots are the bearings at the top and bottom of the daggerboard trunk that restrain the daggerboard. The vertical line is the daggerboard itself. Now a vertical daggerboard that resists the side force from the sail rig is technically a hydrofoil, but in generally in the context we're talking about, when we say a hydrofoil, we mean something that has a vertical component to the lift. And you can get that from a straight board by canting it, by angling it, so that it produces both a horizontal and a vertical component. But the drawback of this is you need to balance both the side force from the sail rig and the weight of the boat. And with the straight board, you have a fixed ratio of those of the horizontal and vertical forces. You cannot independently balance the two. So you can match either the side force or the weight, but you can't balance both at the same time. A C board is curved in the shape of the letter C, and with the C, you can vary the amount of vertical versus horizontal force by changing the amount of board that is extended into the water. When the board is partially raised, it has more vertical than horizontal component and thus more horizontal force than vertical. When you immerse it deeply, then it has more of a horizontal part of the board and produces more vertical force. A J is much like the C. Uh, it just has the curvature down low instead of being even through the entire board. So it has a, a vertical part which is more or less straight and then a curved portion at the bottom which produces the vertical component of the force. Now, like the C, you can vary the ratio of the horizontal to vertical force by raising and lowering the board. The S board is like the J, uh, except that at the top it has a part that curves in the opposite direction. And what this does is it changes the cant angle of the entire board when that curved part enters the area between the bearings. So you can, kind of like the straight board, you can vary the cant angle, but you don't actually have to have a mechanism to cant the entire board trunk. Uh, you can just raise and lower the board a modest amount and that will change the cant angle without dramatically changing the area of the board. The L board is basically the extreme version of the J in which you have a portion which is almost entirely vertical and a portion which is more or less horizontal. So it completely separates the horizontal from the vertical force generation and the vertical force is typically regulated by how the foil is raked forward and aft in the trunk. And then the horizontal component is regulated by the leeway angle. Now you can give a, a, some angle to that wing, what we call the dihedral angle. And when you bend it up as shown on the right, you create a situation where with increasing leeway, you change the vertical force on the, on the wing of the L board. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. And the final type of foil is the T foil, where 
the wing is more or less symmetrically uh, distributed about the vertical element of the foil. And this is used for the rudders. And the reason is that the, the wing now produces less bending moment on the rudder. So it, structurally, you can go with a, a, a smaller rudder than the daggerboard because you don't have the high loads of cantilevering that force uh, off of the off to one side. And the other aspect is you have less coupling between the vertical force on the wing and as the side force has changed. And this is important so that as you're steering the boat, you're not also changing the pitching moments on the boat. So why hydrofoils? Well, for a slender multi-hull, uh, most of the drag comes from skin friction. The wave drag is comparatively low because of the slenderness of the hulls, and skin friction increases with the square of the speed. So the faster you go, the more drag there is. Now the induced drag comes from the dynamic lift on the hydrofoil, and just as we saw with the wing sail, that is the result of deflecting the water in its direction of flow in order to create a force at right angles to the flow. And so that you can get the same force in different ways. You can deflect a lot of water through a small angle, or you can deflect a little bit of water through a large angle and create the same force. But it's always more efficient to deflect a large amount of water by a little bit than it is to deflect a little bit of water by a great deal. And the faster the boat goes, the more water is flowing over the hydrofoil. So to get the same force, you don't have to deflect the water as much when it's going fast as when it's going slow. So this means that the drag actually goes down with speed uh, as, as it the, the boat is going faster. So at, if you want to go fast, it's better to use dynamic lift to support the boat and, and take advantage of that reduction in the drag. Now this also means that there's a crossover speed. At low speed, the amount that you'd have to deflect the water to support the boat would be so great that the drag would be tremendous. But at high speed, you don't have to deflect it very much, so the drag is, is low. And whereas with the, when the boat is floating, at zero speed, it has zero drag. So if you're going slowly, it's better to float. If you're going fast, it's better to fly. So like I say, there's this crossover speed that, where the hydrofoils really become effective. Now at the same time, that you're supporting the boat with the dynamic lift on the foils, you have to be concerned with stability. You want the boat to fly at a constant height and with a, a steady pitch attitude. So if the boat wants to rise up, you want it to naturally come back down. If it pitches bow up or bow down, you want it to naturally return back to that original pitch attitude. And you can control this through the cant of the boards and the rake of the boards. The more cant you have, the more dihedral is on the wing, and the more stable the boat will be. And uh, you, you also then vary the, the rake in order to change the vertical lift on the boards. However, there's a trade-off with performance that the more stable you make the boat, the poorer the performance will be because there's a drag penalty associated with that stability. And so you're, you're constantly trying to balance these two things. Uh, you need the boat to be sailable by the crew, but you also want to perform as much as you can in order to win the race. So here's what it looks like when the hydrofoil sailboat is up on its foils. The, the foils lift the entire boat out of the water. The hulls are not in the water at all. And the only thing that's in the water are is the daggerboard on the leeward hull and the rudder on the leeward hull and perhaps the rudder on the windward hull as well. Uh, sometimes the windward rudder will be out of the water and sometimes in the water. 
And the crew basically has to keep the boat up and balanced on, on those lured foils, kind of like riding a bicycle. So let's talk about that stability that I was talking about. The aerodynamic force on the sail rig pushes the boat sideways, and that has to be countered by a hydrodynamic side force from the board and the rudder. And so as the aerodynamic force pushes the boat sideways, the leeway angle will build up to increase that side force until those two forces uh, uh, exactly oppose each other. And there's also the vertical force on the wing of the of the dagger board that lifts the boat out of the water. And that vertical force has to equal the weight of the boat in order to be in equilibrium. Now, as the boat is lifted out of the water, the vertical part of the board, which is creating that side force, is being reduced. And in order to create the same force, the leeway angle has to increase. And the that increase in leeway angle is has an effect on the vertical force as well because of the dihedral of the wing. So the reason the, the wings are given that dihedral is so that with increasing leeway, it reduces the angle of attack of the wing, reduces the vertical force. So what happens is, as the boat comes up, then the leeway angle increases, the leeway reduces the force on the wing, and that brings the boat back down. So this is how the boat achieves that stable equilibrium. And this was the big breakthrough that Team New Zealand discovered first in the 34th America's Cup uh, development. And Oracle Team USA had to rediscover for themselves in their experiments with the AC-45. So so this is how you can get a boat that will respond stably to flying out of the water without having to have some sort of an automatic stabilization mechanism, which would have been illegal according to the design rule for the AC-72. So next I'd like to talk about the AC-72s themselves and the 34th match for the America's Cup. Two different boats were used in the campaign for the 34th America's Cup match. The smaller of the two boats was the AC-45. It was 45 feet long and had a 70 foot high wing sail. It was sailed with a crew of five. The AC-45 was used for crew training. It was used for the, um, the World Series regattas all over the world, and it was used for development. The AC-72 were the actual race boats. They were 72 feet long, 131 foot high wing sail, sailed with a crew of 11, and each team was allowed to build two of these boats, only one of which was sailed in the America's Cup match itself. The AC-72 was de defined by a design rule that was over 30 pages long. It set things like the length of the hull, the size of the cockpit, the beam of the boat, the figure on the left shows the allowable change or allowable range in the planform shape of the wing sail. Uh, there is a limit in, to the way that the cross sections could be designed for the wing sail. Uh, there are limits on, on the size and number of the jibs and where the head stay had to attach to the boat. So, but within these limits, uh, anything went, any kind of structure, any kind of systems, however the team would have designed and built their boats was fair game. So there is considerable variation between the boats uh, in this uh, AC-72 design. At the same time that the teams were developing their boats, the event management was also coming up with new technology and new ways to run the regatta. Stan Honey and his company had developed liveline graphics, which were graphics that were added in real time to the video feeds. You're probably familiar with this from the Yellow First Downline and NFL broadcasts. Well, 
the same people took this to an extreme degree to overlay graphics on the video being broadcast from the races to help the audience understand better what's going on with sailing. And the, the boats also carried GPS units that were accurate to just a, about an inch. And that was a, allowed for those data to be transmitted to the umpires on shore who sat in a container and did most of the umpiring uh, just watching the data. Now, there are also umpires that were on the water to get an eyes on view of what was going on, but most, most of the umpiring is done from shore. So it was extremely accurate that they could have the graphics to just show that, that were related to the racing rules so they could determine uh, just who was in the right and, and not uh, at any given time during the racing. So the team started off by training with the AC-45s in San Francisco. Most of the, the teams had no experience with wing sails before, so this was really important for sort of leveling the expertise in all of the teams and uh, and getting ready to do the, the racing in the World Series regattas. And we also learned <laughs> about capsizing in San Francisco. This is our first AC-45 capsize where we uh, we dug the bows in and, and pitch pulled the boat. The gentleman you can see falling through the wing sail was our CEO, Russell Coots. The AC-45s were raced both in fleet racing and match racing in World Series regattas uh, around the world, starting off in Cascai, Port Portugal, then moving to Plymouth, England, came back to San Diego and Newport. We were also a couple of regattas in Naples, and we sailed in the Grand Canal in, in Venice and back in San Francisco. And these regattas were attended by thousands of people. They were close to shore. You could watch all the racing. In the past, yacht racing has been, uh, as a spectator sport, second only to correspondence chess. Uh, it's been described as, as two white triangles on a, on a blue background. But with the, the World Series regattas, it was really up close and you could you could hear the grindings the the of the winches the sailors could hear the cheers of the people on shore it was really exciting for both the sailors and the spectators at the same time this is going on back at the ranch the teams were experimenting with foiling the AC72 was originally conceived as a non-foiling boat but New Zealand figured out that within the design rule they could actually make the boats foil and be stable. And when Oracle Team USA got wind that they were experimenting in this direction, they st started a crash course with their AC-45s to develop foiling themselves. And Luna Rosa was using a 33-foot catamaran to also experiment with foiling, following the other two teams. So uh, New Zealand had made a big breakthrough uh, it was thought that the AC-72s couldn't foil because they had no control mechanism allowed in the design rule that would stabilize the boat the way that the moth hydrofoil sailboats are done. But New Zealand discovered uh, the mechanism that I talked about earlier with the coupling between leeway and the vertical force that gave them a stable flying height. And Oracle Team USA had to rediscover that themselves in their developments with the AC-45. And also simultaneously going on is building of the AC-72s themselves. What you see in the upper left is one of the molds that was arriving in San Francisco after having been machined in Sandra Woolley, Washington. And there's just a tremendous amount of work going on in the shed to, uh, to get these AC-72s built. According to the, 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 the America's Cup Deed of Gift, the boats have to be built in the country of origin. And so that's what was going on with these, why the AC-72s had to be built in San Francisco. Then on August 29th, 2012, we launched our first AC-72. 
It finally went sailing on August 31st on a kind of a gray morning. Uh, it's kind of interesting to launch these boats. What you have to do is you lift the wing sail up with a crane and then you set it on the boat. You attach all the stays. Then you lift the entire boat up and set it with a crane and set it in the water. Uh, the object that you're seeing in the bottom left photo, that is a water tank that's added to the base of the wing sail to make it stable when it's hanging from the crane so it doesn't just blow wildly all over the place. And once it's the wing sail is uh, securely attached to the boat, then that water tank was drained and removed. And because of the cables from the, to the crane, the wind instruments at the top of the wing sail would be damaged. And so it wasn't until after the the boat had been launched and the crane disconnected that they could send a sailor up uh, all the way to the top of that 130 foot high wing sail with the wind instruments to attach them to get sailing. And then the the, the head sails were brought on board and and finally the the, the boat was uh, taken out with the chase boats to start the day sailing. So that's how it was when it went out to sail and here's how it came back. Unfortunately, the skin on the dagger board came unbonded from the core and the whole thing just broke off. Ah, huge disaster. Um, so, uh, we were only allowed to build a, a limited number of dagger boards. And so this was our first set and it's ruined the first time we tried it out. But even worse than that was the setback because there, you know, we have no spares. Uh, we are literally dead uh, until we could get something going. So what we did was we took the dagger board from the trimaran that won the previous America's Cup and we hacked it up and we made L-shaped foils out of that dagger board. And that finally got, that got us flying on September 28th. But unfortunately, these also counted as another set of our foils that we were allowed to use in the development. And less than a month later, we were out sailing on a windy day. The wind was building. And when the crew finished their last run and uh, turned to uh, head for home, uh, they dug the, the bows in and pitch poled. And we happened to do this on the strongest ebb tide of the year. The chase boats were unable to pull the capsized boat back against the tide, and it got swept out under the Golden Gate into the Pacific, where the waves collapsed the wing sail. The hull fell down and just pulverized the wing. Uh, it wasn't until the tide changed and that we could finally get it towed back to to the base uh, arriving about three in the morning. Um, just, a, a, just a huge disaster and a setback. Fortunately, nobody was injured in this. And, uh, but there's, no matter how much money you spend on the America's Cup, there's one thing that no amount of money can buy, and that is time. And we had lost time in breaking the dagger board, and now we're going to lose a lot of time in repairing the boat. But we got back to sailing on February 4th with a number of improvements. As you can see in the upper right corner, we now incorporated airbags in the wing sail that could be deployed if the boat capsized again. Uh, in the bottom left, you can see one of the new daggerboard wings that we were experimenting with. And of course, our friends from New Zealand and Artemis were also very interested in our return to sailing. Uh, espionage is uh, alive and well in the America's Cup and of course we had folks that were watching what the other teams were doing as well. Boat 2 got launched on April 22nd, 2013. The main difference between Boat 1 and Boat 2 was in Boat 1 the dagger boards were ahead of the main crossbeam between the hulls and for Boat 2 the crossbeam was moved forward a little bit and the dagger boards were moved back so they were behind the crossbeam. And this 
shifted the dagger boards back relative to the center of gravity of the boat and made it a little bit more stable in pitch and easier to fly. And this was important because all during this time, New Zealand was sailing their boats and developing their techniques to a very high degree. And they were the ones that really mastered the flying jibe, where when you're sailing downwind on, uh, with the wind coming over one side and you turn downwind and across the wind to bring the wind over on the other side, they could do that flying on foils and never touch down. Whereas, with, especially with boat one, we would invariably touch down and then have to accelerate and get back on the foils. And we lost about 100 yards every time we did that. So uh, in order to be competitive, we needed to develop that technique, and uh, which we finally did uh, just prior to the regatta itself. But of course, New Zealand uh, had moved on and had a much better tacking technique than we did, where you do a similar maneuver but upwind. Um, they developed a technique called the roll tack, where they actually used the hydrofoils to very quickly transition from being up on one hull to being up on the other hull. Uh, whereas we would typically flop down, make the turn on both hulls, and then have to reaccelerate. And that turned, to, turned out to be very crucial in the regatta itself. So here's boat two out sailing. We're working on those flying jibes and comparing the, uh, the, the two boats. Now, with a America's Cup campaign, you don't just build a boat and go race it. You build the boat, you test it, you redesign it, you hack it to bits, you rebuild it, you test it, you redesign, hack it to bits, test it, and this just goes on continuously for all the time that you have, right up to the racing and even through the racing itself. So here's an example of some of the extreme changes that we made. We literally cut off the bottoms of the bows of boat two so that we could put in a small wedge and put the bottoms back on in order to change the buoyancy of the, the boat. Um, in the bottom left, you can see one of the, uh, the hydrofoil wings for the, uh, for the rudders that we were experimenting with. And on the right, you can see the mechanism for the wing control system on the AC-72. It's far more complicated than the control system on the AC-45s. This amounted to a mechanical computer that uh, would allow us to change the twist profile, uh, the amount of twist, uh, as and we could even reverse the twist at the top of the wing so that the uh, the top was actually pushing to windward and, and helping to keep the boat upright, which was very useful in depowering the boat in the high winds on San Francisco Bay. Then tragedy struck the America's Cup when Artemis was out uh, testing and training and the main crossbeam on their boat broke uh, the boat uh, uh, folded up and Andrew Simpson was caught between the wing and the hull when the boat collapsed and drowned. Um, and this resulted in everything coming to a stop in the entire event as they worked out how to sail these boats safer, uh, improve structural criteria to make them safer, uh, crew equipment and included um, air bottles for each crew member that they wore so that if they were trapped underwater they had a limited amount of time they could actually breathe to get themselves free. Um, so there are a lot of improvements to the safety uh, of the event that went on as a result of this accident. And then in June we were back sailing again uh, with both of our boats. Two boat testing is the gold standard in developing sailboats because the conditions when you're sailing are so variable from day to day and even from hour to hour that it's difficult to get data that you can compare uh, from sailing one day to the next. And so what you do is you sail two boats uh, close enough that they're in essentially the same wind but far enough apart that they're not interfering with each other and you make a small change to one boat and see what that does 
to its speed compared to the other one. And by making these incremental changes and testing and, and constantly comparing, uh, you can make steady progress in improving the performance of the boat. And of course, we're also using the, the two boats for race tactics, uh, for starting and uh, in mark rounding and that sort of thing. So for the racing itself, it was basically the, started in the summer of 2013 with the Challenger Selection Series. This consisted of some round robins where each of the challengers sailed against each other. And then the, the semifinals and finals uh, where New Zealand came out victorious over Prada and won the right to meet Oracle Team USA in the America's Cup event itself. That started in September. Now, during this time, too, there were some discoveries that uh, of some irregularities in the way Oracle Team USA had prepared their AC-45s during the World Series regattas. And so uh, Oracle Team USA was assessed a two-point penalty in the America's Cup. And that meant that uh, instead of being the, uh, the, the best of 17 races, instead it was the first team to reach nine points. And the American team started off with a minus two points. So we had to win two more races than... Uh, New Zealand in order to successfully defend the cup. So I mentioned that New Zealand had worked out a better attacking technique than we did and their upwind speed was better than ours, which was a real shock because we had expected to be faster than New Zealand upwind and about equal downwind. As a result, New Zealand won four out of the first five races and we only won one. And there were two races each day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And if, you, if your boat broke in the morning race, then you're almost certain to lose the afternoon race because of that. So each team was given the opportunity to postpone the afternoon race for whatever reason. And uh, it, was, it was intended to handle the case where a boat broke, but it didn't have to be a breakage. But you could only do that once during the entire regatta. So after USA lost the, for uh, on race five, they decided to play their postponement card and, uh, and, and not do the second race that day. And... Um, in the uh, press conference afterwards, uh, uh, someone asked uh, Jimmy Spithill if he was in danger of losing his job because of the losses. And his comment was, well, you can be a rooster one day and a feather duster the next. And so, uh, but in fact, there was actually no danger of his uh, losing his job at that point. So we made a number of changes to the boat. Uh, because the next day was a lay day with no racing. If you've ever seen the movie Apollo 13, and there's that scene where the engineers get together and they throw everything on a table that the crew has uh, to work with uh, in order to solve the problem with, with, with what was available. Well, we had exactly that same meeting back at the base after this postponement. We had a meeting with all the designers, all of the sailors, about half of the boat builders were there. And we put out all the ideas, crazy ideas, uh, simple ideas, anything we can think of to solve the problem, the fact that we were slower than New Zealand. We even considered ideas as extreme as moving the main bulkhead in the hull, but we didn't think that we could do that in the, in the time available. Because one of the problems the boat had was Lee Helm. I mentioned this before, where the boat going windward wants to turn away from the wind, and you have to counter that with the rudder. And that hurts your upwind performance. So we, the, the traditional way of solving that is to rake the rig back. But on these boats, because of the way the rig was twisted in order to uh, keep it upright in the high winds, 
uh, raking it was not effective and uh, we had to find some other way to improve that. So what we did was we we opened the slot between the main element and the, the flap because we have a tab that New Zealand did not have and um, we changed the twist profile going up the wing. We also did some minor changes to the hull and uh, so we went out and, and, and tested the next day and uh, made some more changes the following night and uh, then we were racing uh, the day after that. Uh, we actually lost, but we were closer. And so uh, after we lost a couple more times uh, at the press conference, uh, someone asked Jimmy Spithill what his motivation was to to keep going in the in, you know after all of these losses. And Jimmy's response was. I think the question is, imagine if these guys lost from here, what an upset that would be. They've almost got it in the bag. That's my motivation. And everybody thought he was absolutely crazy because uh, Team New, uh, New Zealand uh, only needed to, uh, to win a few more races, and we hadn't even got on the scoreboard yet. So it looked almost like a lost cause. But Jimmy's statement was actually prophetic. So race eight, uh, our speed had improved to the point where we were matching New Zealand upwind, which caught them by surprise. Uh, we were crossing on starboard, and uh, and they had to make a, a, a sudden crash tack to avoid us and nearly capsized, um, which uh, uh, would have been the end of the regatta for them had they gone over. Uh, but they managed to just bring it back. And, uh, but we went on to win that race handily. And that was kind of a turning point for the, uh, for the entire regatta. Then race 13, New Zealand was on the cusp of winning. We had won a couple, but they had also won. And one more race and they would have won it. Uh, but the winds were extremely light. And they weren't able to finish the race within the time limit, even though, and uh, so that race had to be uh, abandoned and then rerun. And we were able to win the, the next race, and matter of fact, kept on winning every race after that <coughs> until we tied up the score. It was just an amazing comeback. And that led to uh, race 18, where um, New Zealand was ahead, they, they tacked in front of us, but we were able to actually foil to windward. This was something that the teams had tried unsuccessfully to do earlier, but we had developed our technique to the point where we could actually foil and get the entire boat out of the water going upwind as well as downwind, and we're able to drive over the top of New Zealand and win the race. And that tied the score between us and New Zealand so we went into the final race, race 19, uh, for all the marbles. Uh, and it, was, it ended up being basically a, a repeat of race 18. The same sort of maneuver where we got up and were able to foil to windward, drive over top of them, and win the race. And there is a, there, I, I wish you could have seen the, uh, the kind of... Um, camaraderie there was during this entire regatta and the team spirit, there was never any finger pointing or uh, blaming other people. Uh, everybody just kept at it and did not let all the losses uh, get them down. It was, it was really quite an amazing atmosphere and, and big celebrations every morning to cheer on the crew as they went off to race. In this huge warehouse, it was our base, each morning, the America's Cup was just out sitting on its plinth in the middle of the, of the base, as you see here in the center photo, with nobody around it. There was actually somebody guarding it up in the hospitality area, keeping an eye on it. But it, it seemed to have two messages. Either get your picture with the cup now because it won't be here tomorrow, or 
remember when you go out, this is what we're fighting for. And um, it was just a, a tremendous thing to, uh, to successfully defend the America's Cup after being down so many races and, and coming back. It was, really was one of the, the great comebacks in sports history. So that's the story of Hydrofoils and the 34th match for the America's Cup. I hope you enjoyed it.